So the next speaker is Professor Lorenz Studer from the Sloan Kettering uh, Institute. And uh, the presentation is entitled Stem Cell Based Approaches. So please, Dr. Studer, the stage is yours. Great, so I hope you can all hear me. Yes, so, sir, we can, we can hear you. If you could just maybe center your camera uh, a little bit. <clears throat> I don't see myself not too well. Uh, just, uh, you are on the one side of the screen rather than in the center. Okay, yeah, better now? There, there we go. Thank you, sir. Okay, perfect. So, welcome everybody. So, what I would like to do is to give you some kind of update of what I think stem cell systems could be used in the context oh, of... Okay, I see uh, we have another uh, a slide uh, 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 problem. We only see uh, the, the slides are cut off. Would you mind exiting out of the presentation? Okay. Shall I try again? Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Do you see now presenter mode? Yeah, now we see presenter mode, but when you switch it to a uh, single screen. Let me try this one. Yeah, okay. Now we see a whole slide. Okay. Can you? Okay. I hope that works. Sorry for the interruption. I just wanted no to- No problem, that's to... important, yeah. Thanks, sir. So again, so I want to just give you a little bit of an update of what we try to do with stem cell-based approaches in general, in the context of both modeling diseases and developing cell therapies. And obviously I have to disappoint you that so far, basically none of our work has directly been on NPAN or any of the NBIAs. So that's something obviously we are considering and we hope that some of the technologies that we are developing could be more uh, broadly available and obviously useful for, for the community. Now, when I talk about stem cells, what I primarily mean in our case is human pluripotent stem cells. Those come in two flavors, either the embryonic derived embryonic stem cells or more widely now used uh, human induced pluripotent stem cells, which are cells that can be now generated truly routinely. It's pretty much a 100% success rate, either from blood, skin, or even urine cells from, from an individual or patient. And so that allows you then to get an unlimited number of stem cells that has the exact DNA of that individual to then study, for example, developmental processes, perform disease modeling, or use such cells potentially for actual applications in, in, in cell therapy. Now, the first step in this process is really how do we go from those pluripotent stem cells, which by themselves are not immediately usable, but they represent a very early embryonic stage, to cell types, for example, of the nervous system. And so over the last uh, 20 years, I would say, we've developed many, many protocols to achieve that, where we give the cells developmental signals, such as wind signals, hedgehog signals, and so forth in the right sequence. It's like a developmental code of factors that these cells are exposed to then step-by-step step make this tree of different cell types of the peripheral or central nervous system. And by now we're already more than 50 cell types and counting. So that you can kind of imagine that in the next few years, we think pretty much all cell types should be accessible in one way or another of human origin and potentially carrying again the exact genetic information of the individual that you want to study for a disease. Now, how would that look to study, for example, the disease? And so very early on, one of the examples we've shown is actually a rare genetic disorder, just to give you an example, which is a disorder called familial dysautonomia where we have a gene called ikb cap that's basically mutated point mutation that leads to basically kind of a partial loss of function. But it was not clear how you go from that very specific gene expressed in every cell type of the body to specifically a dysautonomia, which is obviously a rather specific disease. And so what we could do is get from such patients skin cells, convert them into such stem cells that are patient matched, then differentiate them into the neurons we speculate that might be affected by the disease, for example, autonomic neurons. And you could actually show in this Nature paper that uh, we had three phenotypes that were different if those cells came from a patient versus a control. On the one hand, they actually would make less effectively make 
autonomic neuron, so there was a numbers problem. They would also mismigrate, but maybe the most interesting one was that specifically in those autonomic neurons, they show the splicing defect of this gene. And that suggested then maybe the reason why it just affects the autonomic system is because the splicing is particularly severely affected specifically in those neurons, but not, for example, in the heart or in, in other regions. And we could then use that to test compounds like canetin, a plant hormone, or even the drug screens, where we tested thousands of compounds on this kind of assays to then eventually go and actually do clinical studies. And so that was one such example that obviously we hope would be nice to do for, for disorders like we are discussing today. Now, since then, the systems become only more sophisticated. For example, now we can do that for much more complex disorders, such as disorders where we know might be polygenic, many diseases involved. But even in a monogenic disease, where we know that the exact same mutation in some family members maybe causes a very severe, very early onset form, but in others later, we don't really know why, we can actually use such system to look for genetic interactors and study that not just one mutation at the time, as shown here in this pooled library, but we can actually make a community of patients in a dish in one shot, differentiate them into the cell types we are interested in, and then see whether again anything goes wrong in any of those various genotypes, and then use that information, for example, to classify the disease and figuring out which molecular mechanisms maybe underlie such classifications. So the point I'm trying to make again, that the systems become more and more sophisticated, and they become also more sophisticated on a cellular level, not only with more genetic flexibility, but more cell types. And obviously there is kind of the key word there that we can now do that in 3D, using techniques initially pioneered by people like Yoshiki Sasai, who's one of the first people, maybe this doesn't work properly, one of the first people to show that you actually can grow cells in 3D, make so-called organoids. And again, I don't have time to go into all the different flavors of how you can do that, but you can now make most of the brain regions in 3D, at least the early developmental stages of those brain regions in a, in a reasonably controlled manner. You can even make within one organoid multiple regions, which is shown here, where we basically give the cells a polarizing signal and then makes one part of the organoid the front of the brain and one part of the organoid the more the back of the brain. So you can actually pattern even within those and then see, for example, is one region more vulnerable or affected by a given disease, which again would be quite interesting in a disease where you have specific disease phenotypes occurring in the base of ganglia or in substantia nigra or so forth, to see whether you can try to recreate that in, in a human model system. Now, I'll just give you one example, again, how we try to, to exploit such 3D systems. Is here an example where we look at copy number variation uh, of, of schizophrenia, very, very high risk copy number variations. The most famous one, 22Q11, where you're up to 30% or 40% risk to develop schizophrenia. So you can model those, in this case, not by making the cells directly from the patient, but by taking a generic stem cell line and introducing those copy number variations using CRISPR based techniques. So you have now genetically matched cells, except for this copy number variation. What you can do then is take those cells, and unfortunately we really have no luck with, with movies today. This would be some nice movies where you can actually see how these cells then can be used to study developmental processes that are different in a disease context by labeling the mutant versus the wild type cells in green or red, and having them combined with another region of the brain. So the point here is again that you can play with different regions. For example, this is actually kind of a basal ganglia-like structure that we then have interacting with the cortical structures and see how these cells integrate. For example, interneurons, they migrate into this region and then study what goes wrong in the context of disease. For example, we could show that some of those copy number variations have a specific migration defect. And we can even show, probably again, movies probably seem to not work, but we can even show that, uh, that basically what's wrong with the migration defect. And more generally, again, we have now a system where we can in study in 3D, different brain regions, looking at the relative susceptibility, looking at migration, or for example, doing RNA-seq from the disease 
versus the control derived cell types and see whether we can really use that to understand the mechanism or the functional deficits that these cells might actually uh, exhibit. Just the last example on the, on the modeling is kind of a system that we've just now developing, which I think might also be interesting to really look at processes such as neuroinflammation, because in many neurodegenerative disorders, including MPAN from what I understand, there is a major component of neuroinflammation in the disease as, disease as well, that might, might actually contribute to, to, the, to the progressive nature. And so in this case, we don't really make an organoid with all the cell types, but we actually make very precisely each of the cell types you think that are involved, such as the microglia, the astrocytes, and the neurons. And then we mix them in precise ratios to basically make a tri-culture system in the dish, where you can again mix and match which cell is going to have the mutation, which cell is going to be the control, and look at neuroinflammatory crosstalk. To make that work, we had to actually figure out how can you get growing these cells just simply on plastic conditions where they're not already inflamed, just simply by growing on plastic. And if you look on this panel here, where you look at these classic inflammatory cytokines, you find that baseline, there's pretty much no inflammatory response in this triculture system. But on the right side, if you add an inflammatory chemical, such as LPS, you get quite massive inflammatory responses, particularly if you have them in the triculture settings. You can do that not only in this kind of artificial uh, system, but you can also look uh, basically for many disease-associated proteins that might again drive inflammation, such as, for example, complement production. And just to make one point again to show that this is actually important to have these cells uh, do model neuroinflammation and triculture system, you can compare production of this C3 complement either if you just look at the neurons the neurons with the astrocytes, the microglia with the neurons, or all three cell types together. And what you find is either at baseline or under LPS treatment, this is not a linear correlation. So it's don't just adds up the C3 of each cell type, but actually there's a potentiation happening, which happens through the crosstalk, which mimics the actual neuroinflammatory processes we think that happen in the brain. And you can further prove that by, for example, knocking out then some of those inflammatory molecules such as C3 to see what happens. And in this case, we show that if you look at this strong uh, inflammatory response that we see in the triculture system, you completely abolish it. If you knock out the C3 in the microglia, so alone the astrocytes wouldn't produce any C3. But if you knock it out just in the astrocytes but not the microglia, you also find that you lose more than half of the C3 produced. So what that means is we really study neuroinflammation because normally the astrocytes and the neurons shown over here produce pretty much no C3, but in triculture system, even if none of the complement comes from the microglia, they start doing it. And again, just to show that this is actually disease relevant, you can study that in a degenerative disorders. We have done that for PD, for ALS, or here shown for AD, we can actually show that just simply having an AD mutant neurons in another wild type context, that triculture system senses the difference between having an AD neuron there and actually has increased levels, not only of uh, amyloid production, but actually C3 production shown here in the triculture system. And interestingly, if you then have the same triculture system, but you knock out complement just in the astrocyte, which is shown over here, you find that actually the additional disease-related complement produced seems to come from the astrocytes. Again, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but just to make the point that this is for the first time where we can actually study those cellular interactions and show that maybe the microglia seem to sense the process, the disease-associated process, but then actually recruit astrocytes into maintaining that neuroinflammatory process and what we are now doing is in fact using that for developing new compounds that can break that neuroinflammatory loop in such a system. And again, that is something which I think is gonna be applicable not only for as shown here in AD, but probably for many degenerative disorders and possibly even for disorders like, like MPAN. And so just for the final part of this, um, for the modeling part, we think again that we have a very powerful system that might be very interesting to study various diseases, including uh, and pan. Uh, 
and that we can study this crosstalk in an interesting way and really dig down on what's the mechanism and try to use that for drug screening because in fact we can use those cultures in 96 rated four well plates and make thousands of wells at the time. But again, obviously the other main component of when we talk about stem cell approaches is really, can we use the stem cells themselves as a potential therapy? And this is again a hot topic. We are not really as far evolved as the current wave of gene therapies that are coming basically to clinical approval, but we are basically uh, trying to follow on those steps to getting approval for certain degenerative disorders as well. And maybe the example that's one of the most evolved on is Parkinson's disease, which is obviously interesting given the Parkinsonian symptoms that are observed in the context of MPAN. And again, we can discuss more to what extent those data are actually relevant in a disease like MPAN. But it's at least relevant as a proof of concept for bringing cell therapy towards clinical application. In Parkinson's disease, we have a very well known pathophysiology. We know that the symptoms of, at least the motor symptoms, of the disease are caused by a loss of cells in the substantia nigra. We know exactly how many cells are normally there. It's about less than half a million. We know how many cells have to be lost to get the symptoms. And so we have a very clear goal. It's like the Lego piece missing in the disease that we try to place back. And again, in this case, obviously much more challenging for the disease like MPAN, where we just heard again, how widespread we probably have to really treat the brain ultimately there. But again, in the context of Parkinson's disease, there has been already proof of concept of the idea using fetal tissue grafting. And there were at least, even so the results were rather mixed. There were some patients that did remarkably well, even 15, or what I show you here, 24 years later after transplantation, where you can see here in brown, surviving grafts that survived for 23 of those 24 years without any immune suppression and continue to produce new dopamine in this patient's brain. Now we think again, this is actually a feasible way to pursue cell replacement, even so we don't think fetal tissue is appropriate for many reasons, the ethical reason, just simply the practical reason that this never could become a routine therapy. Now with stem cells, I showed you, we can make billions of those cells. And in fact, this shows you some of the several hundreds of wires that we've generated for making now such dopamine neurons directly from stem cells and doing so actually under GMP conditions. And so we've generated about 10 billion of those cells. We can cryopreserve the cells. So it's like a drug product that you have in a vial ready to go. And we have many criteria to define what actually makes the potency of those cells. And we've now finished all the preclinical studies, toxicology, safety, and also efficacy studies to show that we can reliably rescue the behavioral deficits in a Parkinsonian model of the disease. And we can do that safely across hundreds of animals with up to at least more than a year of long-term safety data. And what you can see here on the right side is our setup for actually injecting those cells. And again, unfortunately the movie I think probably still doesn't work either. But so we actually have an MRI guided injection. We actually also work closely with Chris Bankiewicz with regard to this actually very similar system that they use for gene therapy delivery, where we can directly see where cells get injected, where we can make sure that this happens at the maximum safety with regard to not risking blood vessels, or at least to monitor if there anything goes wrong because we want to graft two sides of a patient's brain in one session to really achieve a full replacement of these about half a million dopamine neurons that should be there in a healthy uh, individual. And this just shows you in the context of Parkinson's disease, even so we made the proof of concept already nearly 10 years ago, it took us nearly another 10 years to get now to the stage where at the end of the year, we should have all the approvals ready to actually start the 10 patient phase one clinical trial. We had about two years of delay actually, because again, so far there hasn't been really an effort with a nearly pure dopamine or actually neuronal product in the brain to truly have a cell replacement strategy that then would stay there in the life of a patient. As I show you, they should be there 25 years later and should be a one-time shot for treating such patients. So again, we are kind of at the verge of trying to do that in Parkinson's disease. And there are um, many important considerations. And one consideration of is the money that's needed. That's also my disclosure that I started a company, basically that actually sponsors that research now as licensed the technology. And the main reason for really doing that, moving in from academia is really the large amount of money needed for actually getting a cell therapy, definitely to the early stage trials, 
even more so the later stage trials. Now, even there, many steps are needed to make that a routine approach. You need to scale up that even further for actual commercial use. And again, one interesting question is also, again, the immune response that might be interesting if you think about MPAN, how you would do that. If you were to take patient specific cells that maybe would have no immune reaction, you would have at the same time also to perform gene correction. And again, it makes it even more expensive exactly. if you have to do that for the patient. Yeah. Sorry, you have one minute. Yes, I'm pretty much done there. And so the other alternative is that you actually make what's called universal cell lines, where you then would have one cell line that's edited that should basically prevent an immune response in those cells. And that can again be done routinely uh, on the GMP produced uh, cells. And again, I just, that's just very broadly the point that this is not limited obviously to dopamine neurons. We work on many other approaches. And again, that's the question here more broadly, is that something that could be translated to diseases where many cell types are affected. It's definitely realistic for glial cell replacement, maybe even for replacing other neurons, as shown here, where we have now some success of doing a replacement of cortical neurons. And again, this would be again a movie where you should be able to see that. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. But all this white stuff you see here is actually human neurons and fibers in the cortex of a mouse brain. So where you can get very widespread integration of human cells in a cortical brain. So technically, these things are becoming more routinely possible. I think my feeling is that on the immediate future, more realistic use of stem cells is going to be clearly in disease modeling. Here are some of the points now where I think this could be useful, but I'm definitely happy to discuss you now where this could go with regard to actual clinical translation, how we can learn from our efforts in Parkinson's and other diseases, and what would be potential targets? Is it worse to try to make components of basal ganglia, substantia nigra, putting them back, and so forth? So technically it's possible to do it, but is it the right approach from a disease perspective? That's obviously uh, truly an open question. And I'm gonna end here and see whether we still have some time for some questions.